Hello and welcome to HTVB Online. My name is Leon and this is Phoebe and we are your hosts for today. Hey, look, we're so glad you could join us. We've got a great service lined up. In fact, Phoebe, could you tell us what's, what's happening today? Well, we're going to hear from Jacintha. We'll continue our sermon series, Wise Up, all from the book of James. Amazing. Really looking forward to that. Hey, how have you been feeling? You know, as things have opened up a little bit more, I know some of us may be reuniting with friends, family, uh, but maybe some of us are still isolating at home um, until the situation settles down a little bit more. Um, Whichever category you fall in, just know that you can find connection here with one another, but most importantly, with God. Um, yeah. One of the ways that we can do that is through prayer. And at any time during the service, if there's anything that you'd like prayed for, just request prayer and one of our team will be right in touch with you to pray. And another way that we can connect with God is through worship. Because yeah. we believe that God can meet with us in the time of worship. So um, you can stand or uh, be, just make yourself comfortable in any position that can help you engage in this time. Let's pray before we start. Lord, we thank you that we can meet with you and we can connect with you through worship. Won't you draw close to us as we draw close to you and fill us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's worship.
wildest ocean Oh, nothing else compares Oh, Lord
Church, let's pray for wisdom in our relationships. Abba Father, we remember Ephesians 4.32, which tells us to be kind and tender-hearted to each other, forgiving one another just as God through Christ has forgiven us. Lord, we understand that although these are challenging times for many, we are all going through it differently. May we be kind and be quick to forgive and quick to ask for forgiveness wherever we need to. We thank you for all our friends, our family and our colleagues. May we show God's love to them wherever possible. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all of the opportunities in our personal lives to grow as individuals and in our walk with you. We pray for encouragement and wisdom as we go through the ups and downs of life. We especially lift up in this time the university students who are starting this really exciting time in their lives and we pray that they're constantly reminded of your presence throughout it all. Amen. Thanks so much for leading us in prayer. Amen. Yeah. Well, Alpha is starting this week on Wednesday, 6 October. And it's just exciting to be able to start another round yeah. of Alpha. And uh, we love hearing stories from people who have done Alpha, been yeah. through it, and see how their lives have been transformed by Jesus. And Leon, you recently actually like talked to May in one of the guests, right? That's from right. Alpha. That's yeah. right. So why don't we hear from May? Can you start by telling us how you came on Alpha? I didn't have a little faith. Um, in Christ before joining Alpha, but it's just that um, I'm also very skeptical about this and I have still a lot of questions. And coincidentally that on um, the the round that I did join, I was during my mid sem break. So I was thinking like why not why not to occupy my break uh, with Alpha? Who was it who convinced you to come on Alpha? Um, because I'm currently staying with my aunt and she's quite a strong believer. So she's like, why why don't you give it a go, give it a shot? Because like my cousins, they all did join before and they said it was quite fun and you get to meet uh, lots of different people. And yeah, they said it's, it's something I should join. That's why I tried. What was the biggest difference of sort of having like a faith before but then trying Alpha? How did that kind of change things for you? Um... I think like Alpha has definitely changed um, the way I look at reading the Bible. Like previously, I did try to pick up and read. I quit after a week of doing that. Couldn't sustain that. But then like um, during Alpha, there's this one week uh, where we talked about like how to read the Bible. Then um, my group leader came up with a very good suggestion to use the audio version so that in a way that you can integrate it in your everyday life. So I did it um, during breakfast or it's like a bedtime story for me um, before bed. So yeah, it's, it's been easier that way. And also I find out that um, it's so amazing that you are not reading just for the sake of reading. But in a way, um, there's something God wants to tell us every single day. And I could find answers to my struggles every day and words of comfort from Him. Is there a particular highlight during your experience on Alpha? I would say, uh, especially during the Alpha Weekend Away where we talk about Holy Spirit. Yeah, that week has been very interesting because like we came up with a lot of questions like if there is Holy Spirit, is there unholy spirit as well? Yeah, questions like that, which I really find it quite fun. And it, it was a longer session, I would say, for that week. But then like it helped us as a group to bond better as well, to share more stories as well. Did you have like a particular um, experience of, of the Holy Spirit during the weekend away? I would say what really surprised me was when during um, the prayer session we, um, that week, we were right into breakout rooms, went to breakout rooms. So like I was with my group leader and he was um, praying for each and one of us. And I was really surprised like, what he said, what he prayed back then was exactly what I needed and it was the situation that, that I was in that because he said that he could feel, feel that um, I'm very lost um, in finding my directions in terms of what to look for after um, my studies and all that. So like, yeah, that kind of blew me away. Like, wow, I didn't tell him anything beforehand. So I guess that's Holy Spirit working, man. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. 
Finally, Mayne, um, what difference would you say that Jesus has made um, in your life? I would say that he definitely had taught me um, to not always find fault and pick fight with others, but instead like um, to love our neighbours more, like try to put ourselves um, in other people's shoes, like why they react a certain way, um, and try to reflect more on our actions and words as well, instead of judging others and putting blame on others uh, at the very first place. What a story. Um, again, if there's someone on your mind that you'd love to invite, please invite them along. And you know, we, we're, we're helping you out here. We're giving you QR codes. All you need to do is scan the QR code and an invite will be right with you. We're now going to watch HTVV News and coming up this month is the CHTVV Light Party. Woo! So Light Party is uh, an event we have every year for all the kids at HTVV. It's a great celebration. And this year, uh, we're also going to have Bintang, back with Yay. us! Yay. I'm jealous, I want to go. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. We're now going to watch HTBB News. This is also a chance for us to give. Um, instructions on how to give are going to show up, so just follow those. Uh, and just we just want to say thank you in advance for all that you give to the church. So let's give as we watch HTBB News. There will never be enough books. There will never be enough works of art. There will never be enough songs to celebrate how incredible the goodness, the love, the grace, and the mercy of God is. As a church, we've seen the goodness of God and we want to make it known. We are so excited to be releasing our first ever HTBB Worship EP. These are a collection of songs that put lyrics and melodies to everything that God's been doing in our community in this season. The picture of heaven's throne room in the book of Revelation is probably the ultimate depiction of worship. And what it reminds us is that when we begin to sing to God, we aren't starting worship, we're entering in to worship. The sound of heaven rings from the beginning of time right through to the end of time and into all of eternity. And we are joining in. We're joining with those that have gone before and all of those who will come after. We are joining with millions of angels in heaven and with every fiber of creation on earth. And the beauty is that through Jesus in this eternal song, we are at home. It's where we find belonging as the children of God. No matter where you hear these songs, whether it's singing them in church or maybe listening in your car on the way to work or perhaps you've got them on on Spotify while you're cooking dinner, well, wherever it is, it's our prayer that in that moment, 
you would enter the eternal song of heaven, that you would experience joy, purpose, and belonging in the presence of God. It's so exciting to have our very first worship EP. Yeah. So check it out on 22nd October. That's right. Uh, now, Jacintha is going to speak to us. Uh, Jacintha is married to Abel. She's one of our pastors here. Yeah. And she and Abel head up our 5 p.m. service. Um, but without further ado, let's listen to this word. We're so um, expectant on how God is going to speak to us through this. Yeah. Hey everyone, it's great to be with you all today. If we haven't met, my name is Jacintha, and I'm one of the pastors here at HTBB. I wonder how many of you are fighting battles this season. You know, one ongoing battle for me is with Levi, our toddler's nap time. He's at a phase where when it's nap time, he just wants to play. If you're a parent of a little one and this is you, I see you. The struggle is real. You know, two weekends ago, my fight with his nap time peaked when I had tried everything to get him to sleep. I mean, the room was dark, the temperature was just right, I sat next to his cot, I tried to pat him, I even tried using my best singing voice to soothe him. Nothing seemed to work. What made it worse was right before this, I'd just gotten upset at Abel. You see, when Levi was winding down, Abel played with him in a way that I thought had made it harder for Levi to go to sleep. So not only was I battling with Levi's nap, I was doing somersaults in my mind. I was thinking, ugh, it's all Abel's fault. Oh, but I shouldn't have said that. Oh, why can't I be more patient? All of this while trying to soothe an overtired toddler. Hands up if this has ever happened to you, or maybe it's just me. After 45 minutes, I decided to give up. And with my tails between my legs, I tapped out and I swapped with Abel. Abel went into Levi's room, and I kid you not, five minutes later, Levi was fast asleep. I know what you're thinking, how annoying. With as much humility as I could muster, I then texted Abel, you win. And how does he respond? All I can say, my love, is that the problem wasn't me. What if the battles we're fighting are part of our becoming? In the Bible in one year, Nikki Gumbel says, life is a series of battles and blessings, battles and blessings. And as we look around us, battles are everywhere. We read news of conflict. We see videos of attacks. We hear stories of political upheaval. And the human heart is so accustomed to both the reality of war and the longing for peace that books have been written about exactly this, war and peace. And yet, in light of everything happening around us, how do we make sense of the wars in our world or the battles in our homes and our relationships? Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. As we partner with Jesus to love others the best we can, we see from Scripture, from the book of James in chapter 3, that God promises to give us wisdom, wisdom from heaven that is pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. We're in the middle of a sermon series called Wise Up, and the question that many of us may be asking is, how do I get this kind of wisdom to fight my battles. How can I have this wisdom to bring about peace in my life? I want to speak into this today. Last week, Abby spoke from James chapter 1 about how we train through our trials. And today, we'll jump right ahead to James chapter 4 and try to tackle together the source of these trials. Let's read the passage together now from verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. 
Or do you think scripture says without reason that He jealously longs for the Spirit He has caused to dwell in us, but He gives us more grace? And that is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. I just wrapped up eight weeks of a discipleship group with a bunch of university girls. And in our final week, when we went around the group, we asked what everyone's takeaways were from our time together. One of them, Mia, she said, the most insightful thing, she said, we may be fighting different battles, but we have the same enemy. And so although we're in a war, we're in this war together. We're fighting on the same team. And so I've titled this sermon, Wise Up, We're in a War. If we're going to have this kind of wisdom that James talks about to fight our common enemy and to bring about peace in our lives, what truths can we face our wars with today? You know, scripture is full of truth, but for today, I want to focus on three things. It's not about me. It's not on me, but it does start with me. Firstly, it's not about me. In verse one, it says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You know, James is saying here that if we really dig deep, at the root of it, wars come from our desires, desires that are often dictated by the self-serving ways of the world. Have you ever wondered why some of us are more motivated to leave our careers behind to build a family, while others of us are more ambitious in our corporate careers? Why is it that some of us eat to live, while others, you know, pre-pandemic of course, would drive hours to and from Malacca for some of the best chicken rice balls? And why is it that some toddlers choose the red cup first and then have a meltdown because you didn't give them the yellow cup? I know, the last one baffles me as well. Researchers have studied human desires for dozens of years and one particular psychologist, Stephen Rice, he conducted a study on thousands of people. And at the end of it, he concluded that we can boil down all human desires to 16 universal ones. And while we all have de these 16 desires in some shape or form, how we prioritize some desires over others dictates the difference in how we behave from one person to the next. What desires drive you? What motivates you? According to Rice, some examples of these 16 desires are acceptance, order, independence, and status. And these desires are not bad in and of themselves, but because of the brokenness of the world we live in, these desires can end up defining us. They may even have the power to destroy us. You know, we are what we love after all. And as we give ourselves to God through the process of discipleship, He can shape our desires to be more like His. And so as we allow God to use our battles to form the basis of our becoming, I wonder if the first step is to take a step back and to first determine the desires underlying these battles. You know, sometimes the best thing we can do is to be honest about the desires that drive us, where they come from. And there could be a variety of reasons. You know, childhood, genetics, family upbringing, circumstances, our inbuilt personality. And as the Holy Spirit helps us to grow in our awareness of the desires that drive us, we can then decide how best to behave. And then as we discern what they are, we can ask God what to do next. You know, in verse 2, it says, you do not have because you do not ask God. You see, if there's one person you can ask for help from, one person that you can be fully honest with, it's God. He knows your heart's desires even more than you do. And He loves you just the same. I believe that the key to healing starts with honesty with God. And if honesty with God helps us to determine our desires, wisdom from God helps us to decide it's not about me. I'm reminded of a story in the Old Testament of a prophet called Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah has the most amazing encounter with God. You see, he's with 450 prophets of Baal 
And Elijah and these false prophets decide, you know, as you do, to have a little competition to see which God would respond first. And so these prophets go first, and from morning till noon, they call on the name of Baal, Baal, answer us. They shout louder and louder, but no response. Then it was Elijah's turn. He simply prepared the altar, prayed, and immediately the fire of the Lord appeared. In verse 39, it says, when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate. The, the prophets of Baal fell prostrate and they cried, the Lord, He is God. You know, Elijah single-handedly showed the prophets the power of God won against 450. And he even points to the fact that he was the only one. In verse 22, he said, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Later on, we see how this powerful encounter with God makes the king's wife Jezebel really mad at Elijah. So he goes into hiding from her and he goes to the wilderness. And when he finds himself alone there, he begins to feel sorry for himself. He even prayed that he might die. Now, Elijah feeling sorry for himself didn't discount the fact that God had just used him in the most powerful way. It didn't mean that he wasn't a good guy or a clear communicator or a faithful follower of God. He was all of these things. And yet he was just being honest about his desires with God. He was saying, look at me, God. Look at what I've single-handedly done. Are you proud of me? It's been said the greatest battles you will ever fight happen in your room alone in the dark. And we see this with Elijah, you know, when the adrenaline had subsided and as he rested all alone, the enemy made his move. His strategy is often to make you say to yourself, look at how great I am. And yet it was in that moment that God came near to him. God's strategy couldn't be more different. It's to get you to look at him, he says, wise up, look up, and let me in. If we're going to emerge strong, we need to recognize we're fighting a war. What battles can you bring before the Lord today? The second truth we can face our wars with is that it's not on me. When we think about war, we often think about, you know, the army commander who leads the charge in winning the war. If I mention war movie, you might think Andrew Garfield in Hacksaw Ridge, Gal Gadot in Wonder Woman. The heroes in these stories, the image that comes to mind might be Mel Gibson as William Wallace on a horse with his long hair and the blue paint on his face. And he's probably saying, they may take our lives, but they may never take our freedom. Humans are hardwired to draw hope from heroes. But what if God designed us to be a bit more like Dunkirk? The miracle of Dunkirk is one of the most amazing war stories I know. In May 1940, over 300,000 soldiers from the British Army and other Allied nations were cornered on the shores of Dunkirk in France. Hitler's army was getting ready to completely destroy them, and their only escape was across the choppy waters of the English Channel. And that seemed like a suicide mission. So for days, the Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, he resisted that escape plan. He thought, you know, they'd be lucky to get 30,000 men home, let alone more than 300,000. So for him, there was no other option. So he prepared to announce to the public the horrific news of their imminent death. And he met with King George VI to brief him. But instead of giving in to Churchill, the king said, no, there must be another way. We must pray. This next Sunday, I'm calling for a national day of prayer. That Sunday, across Britain, tens of thousands of people responded to the King's call, uniting as never before. Churches all across the country overflowed with people praying for the safety of their soldiers. One English newspaper described the scene, nothing like this has ever happened before. And then something happened that till this day, no one can explain. Hitler did the unthinkable and he paused the mission. So for nearly three days, as Britain prayed as one, Hitler's tanks remained grounded. Nothing moved. It was the exact window of time the British needed to form a protective perimeter while they evacuated the troops. And then 
the most incredible thing happened as they began to evacuate over 800 small civilian boats kept coming out of nowhere. Motorboats, fishing boats, rowboats, none of them armed. As the nation looked up to God in prayer, the soldiers looked around and saw deliverance. And at the end of it all, thanks to the 800 civilian boats, over 300,000 soldiers made it safely home. You see, it's not on you to win the war. Whatever battle you're fighting today, you can find strength in like-minded soldiers, or in the case of Dunkirk, selfless civilians. Elijah thought he was the only one left. But then God said to him, yet I reserve 7,000 in Israel. All along, Elijah thought he was alone, but there were 7,000 others who would soon be fighting with him. And this gave him strength. He could wise up and soldier on. If you feel alone in your battle today, is there someone you can reach out to for help? I'd love to encourage you to reach out. You can do that right now by clicking the request prayer button. We'd love to pray with you. You can surround yourself with community by joining a connect group or a team here at HTBB. James says, you do not have because you do not ask. And I wonder if the most courageous thing you can do right now is to ask for help. Don't do this alone. Oh, but Jacintha, you don't know the circumstances I'm in. I mean, my company is understaffed and at home it really does all fall on me. So as much as I want to ask for help, I know I won't get the help that I need. If that's you, maybe your desire is simply to feel seen and understood. I want you to know that God sees you. He understands all that you're going through and He loves you just the same. He's with you. He's for you. And He gives you the strength not just to stay where you are, but to soldier on. We see that with Elijah. God showed up when his supply was running short. It says, A great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. God showed up, not in a mighty wind or earthquake or fire. This time, God was so close to Elijah that all he needed to do was to whisper. He was saying to him, I am bigger than your battle, stronger than your struggle, but I'm also present in your pain. The same God who was found in the fire is the same God who's fighting our battles and who's ultimately won the war. He is powerful and proximate. He never fails us and He's near. So if today you feel alone in your battles, know that it's not on you to win the war. You can look around and ask for help from a support group. You can look up and surrender. The battle belongs to the Lord. And you can draw strength from God and soldier on because while it isn't about me and neither is it on me, winning the war does start with me. Now, what do I mean by this? I once read a story about a little boy and his dad and the dad was wrapping up some work and so he wanted to keep his son occupied. So he took out a magazine, he found a picture of a map, he tore it up into pieces, he gave it to him and he said, here you go, here is a puzzle of the map of the world. And he thought it would take him hours to put it together. And by then, they could both play. Now, about 10 minutes later, the boy came to his dad and he said, OK, I'm done. Can we play now? The dad was surprised and he was saying, what? That should have taken you hours. How did it only take you 10 minutes? So they went to see the picture and there it was all put together, every piece in its place. And the dad said, whoa. And the boy said, well, how did I do it? On the back of the page was a picture of a man. When I put this person together, the whole world fell into place. Now, while this story is a little cheesy and may suggest that the path to world peace is fairly straightforward, it really isn't, it does tell us something about where all wars begin. Spoiler alert, they start from within. 
And this means that as we determine our desires, we can predict our patterns. You know, a few years ago, the American National Institute on Drug Abuse confirmed that at least half a person's propensity to be addicted to substances like alcohol or drugs can be linked back to genetic factors. And while it might not be the same as substance abuse, I see patterns in my family too. I can see how certain quirks run in my family. For example, I'm terrified of rats, just like my mum. Abel never puts hot soup in a plastic container, just like his mum. And while the world might say propensity determines your identity, we believe it's the Lord who determines your destiny. As we submit ourselves to God, as we resist the devil, as we come near to God, as we remain in a posture of humility, Scripture promises in verse 6, He gives us more grace. If you're at the end of your rope and you find yourself becoming exhausted, resentful or bitter in the battles you've been through, God always has more grace. In the war movie of our hearts, we make ourselves the hero. But as we surrender to him, we begin to see that the protagonist has been Jesus all along. And that is good news because it means that while it's not on me to win the war, his spirit empowers me to do something about it. You see, because Jesus went to the cross and won in the ultimate war against death, his victorious spirit lives in us. In the generational patterns of sin and shame in our families, Christ calls us to be the circuit breaker. It's through your battles God is growing in you, not a fragile faith, but a Jesus-dependent joy, so that you don't just survive through it, but that you grow steadily through it and break any chain of the enemy for your children, your colleagues, and your community around you. So today, you can ask God for wisdom to pick your battles. God doesn't want you to win the argument, but lose the war. He wants you to play the long game and to last through it, to love in spite of it, and to leave better because of it. Because it's not about you, but about your becoming, to be a blessing. And in that, for the name of Jesus to be lifted high. Amen. Let's just spend some time praying Right now, um, I'd love to invite you to open up your hands like this in a posture of just wanting to receive from God. And I'm going to say that ancient prayer right now. Would you pray along with me? Come, Holy Spirit, we invite you to help us to face our battles today. I have a sense that there might be someone here who you've been fighting battles for so long that you might not even realize that you're in a war and the Lord wants to come near to you. He wants to give you new strength for the wars ahead of you. There might also be someone here and um, today the Holy Spirit wants to give you new strategies to fight the battles ahead of you. There might also be someone here who you've been caring for elderly parents for, for a long time and God wants to give you new strength for that, that challenge and for that act of love that you have in your family. But if there's anything else that you'd love prayer for, we'd love to pray with you. We want to pray that God will strengthen all of us to fight the battles ahead of us. And so it doesn't matter whether your battle feels big and overwhelming or feels small, too small to ask for prayer. Nothing is too small to bring before the Lord. So we'd love to pray with you. Click request prayer. And as we pray, let's finish with this final song of worship. With a thousand tongues to lift one cry From north to south and east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth echoing Yes. 
thank you that in you we can find wisdom and so lord i ask that you would help us to operate within that wisdom whether at home whether at school uh, whether in our workplaces lord we ask for more of your spirit of wisdom to come and fill us in jesus name amen 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 you can reach out for prayer please continue to reach out for prayer at any time in the service just again hit request prayer and one of our team will be right with you Thank you so much for joining us for HTBB Online today. Remember to check out our new season of On Leadership that has already been released on YouTube and Spotify. We hope you have a great week ahead.